It's Friday, June 13th, let's talk PlayStation. I want to immediately thank everybody for watching the PlayStation Vita documentary video that I worked very hard on. Uh, it seems like a lot of you have watched it and really enjoyed it, and I'm so thankful that that video actually did quite well and everyone really enjoyed it. I would love to do more stuff like that, and it seems like a lot of you guys want me to, but obviously that took a very long time, so don't expect another one for a little while until I find the time to, to start up another one, but thank you very much. And again, if, if you could, uh, if you want to, um, your support on Patreon is always greatly appreciated. Anyway, let's get into our first news story, which is about uh, Mr. Shuhei Yoshida, of course, uh, head of Sony Worldwide Studios, uh, recently made a comment at uh, Develop Brighton, uh, talking a little bit about his history at the company. He said a lot of interesting things. The one thing I want to talk about specifically was him talking about the PlayStation 3's price reveal back in 2006, of course, um, when Sony revealed the pl uh, price of the PlayStation 3 at E3. Well, actually, this was, e yeah, this was E3 2006, um, where Kaz Rai famously said 599 US dollars. And what's funny is that because this is over a decade old now, I mean, this is well over 10 years ago, we've actually heard a few... Um, stories finally come out about that specific moment in Sony's history and that e th that special E3 moment and how that whole E3 is kind of a crazy disaster. Um, and one particular news story a long time ago was that the Microsoft guys, um, when they were watching Sony's show, they actually freaked out and they, they thought to themselves, like they were shocked that it was $600. Um, and the Microsoft guys were actually talking to each other, thinking to themselves, like, did he really just say that? Like, that's kind of like a, you know, like, the, through the grapevine of what actually happened back then. But from Sony's perspective, Shuhei Yoshida said that uh, the price reveal was horrifying. Um, and he didn't really provide m more explanation beyond that, which is unsight, which sucks because I actually would have loved to hear a little bit more as to why. I mean, we all know why it was horrifying, but I would like to know why. I would like to hear Sony's perspective on how they, well, clearly they knew they were uncomfortable selling it at $600 for a multitude of reasons. One being that, yeah, $600 is a lot to ask from the consumer. I mean, even $500 uh, with the base 20 gigabyte model PS3 back in 2006. Uh, but more specifically, also what some people don't realize is that even at $500 and $600, Sony was selling the PlayStation 3 at a loss as it was costing them about $800 some odd dollars to manufacture each PlayStation 3. So every time they made a sale, they lost money, um, which was uh, 10 years ago that was quite typical. Um, in, in with the hardware manufacturers because they would earn more money via software. Long It was a long-term thing. They knew they were going to take a loss on hardware, but software sales would recoup that. You know, just two or three games attached to per system, they would um, see a return on their investment. But I really would have loved to hear why Shuhei <laughs> said that that was a horrifying moment. Like, why, Shuhei? Please tell us a little bit more about that history within Sony. So we haven't really touched on this because uh, it was mostly not true at all, and Corey Barlog is even confirming this, but... Um, when God of War came out um, back in April, and a lot of people were talking about um, a Netflix series being produced that was kind of like a kind of a lame rumor floating around, and sure enough, it was debunked uh, multiple times. But Corey Barlog had recently mentioned once again, definitely not happening. However, he did tweet that uh, you know, tweeting at Netflix like, yeah, well, we should totally uh, we should get this going, basically. Um, which you know, I mean, of course, Corey's going to try and start something up like that. It's a harmless tweet. I wouldn't expect anything of it, but um, that would be quite interesting. I've said this a number of times, which is that Sony has so many of these fantastic IP that certainly could, if done properly, translate uh, quite well to other mediums. Um, and I think God of War would be, well, I mean, God of War I think would be a great topic. Although I would be afraid of how it translates purely because God of War is pretty demanding in terms of. The visual effects so you would need quite a big budget to kind of do what god of war is aiming at in terms of the monsters and you know the the lore that uh, the god of war setting typically requires so you would need like almost kind of like an hbo type situation where you need a lot of heavy funding to um to make that series kind of uh, go off the ground of course netflix i think um has been doing some pretty big budget stuff as well but you know what I mean? I mean, you're gonna need you're gonna need a lot to to really stay because otherwise you're gonna get like lame looking effects or just not you're not gonna get monsters in general. You know what I mean? Like so, but it's it's still um it's it piques my fancy and I, I sure a lot I'm sure a lot of people would like to see something uh something like that happen. While we're on the topic of games going into TV and movies, um, we got a little update on the Uncharted movie, which is that the actor Nathan Fillion recently posted on Instagram. Um, with uh, the title under a picture, Sick Parvis Magna, 
Uh, and he put the date 7-16-2018. And the picture is uh, the rapper Drake, but we all know that's kind of an innuendo for Nathan Drake because, of course, the caption Sick Parvis Magna is from the Uncharted games, which um, roughly translate to greatness from small beginnings. And um, the last update that we really got from the Uncharted movie was that uh, a script was actually done. Um, the story was supposed to be based on a, a young Drake, and uh, Tom Holland was poised to play young Drake. And it was supposed to be more of a you know an origin story of Drake and Sully, um, which sounds awesome. And I, I think Tom Holland actually would have done a pretty great job at the role. Maybe he still will play a role in this. Um, but we yeah, Nathan Fillion, of course, has voiced a number of times how he wants to actually play Nathan Drake. So a lot of the, the rumor right now floating like floating around is that um, we could see a reveal on that date, which would be uh, that would be Monday the 16th. So we won't find out until then, but maybe there's actually finally a little something going on with this Uncharted movie, and uh, we'll find out come Monday. Now segueing nicely into our next news story, which is uh, some more Naughty Dog stuff. Um, this information actually, it's like, it's not new per se, but it's resurfaced because a lot of people actually didn't know about this because this information came out a long time ago with the very first Uncharted game, but uh, again, it resurfaced. So Naughty Dog developer Jonathan Cooper um, had recently tweeted how in the Uncharted games, you don't actually have a health meter. You're not actually taking bullet shots up until it's fatal. It's actually a situation where when the screen becomes black and white, that is supposed to signify that Drake is running out of luck. And that when it gets severely black and white to the point where you're going to die, the bl that basically means you're, the next shot is going to hit you and that's going to be the shot that kills you. Because admittedly, if we're talking about um, a real grounded situation of a human taking bullets, you don't heal from a bullet wound right away. And uh, certainly just one or two bullets is pretty much going to kill you. So the idea there is actually that um, you're running out of luck. And then uh, Naughty Dog basically can... like company-wide confirm this uh because again this is like a situation where a lot of people were like oh i didn't know that so a lot of people are like asking around naughty dog said they kind of did this because it's a situation where they were kind of um playing it up to like the, the the hollywood theme basically and uh even amy henning who used to be with naughty dog she also confirmed that that was uh basically exactly what the the company was aiming for uh black and white signifies drake running out of luck pretty you know it's funny too because when i read that i was like oh yeah that is a thing in that game, because, like, you don't really even think about it. Um, we're so used to just, like, okay, you take damage, you're hurting, then wait a little bit, you heal back up. But uh, if you want, a, like, a more technical explanation of, like, oh, how come Drake isn't dead? Clearly he should be dead by now. Well, he never actually got shot. He's just running out of luck. Moving on to our next Naughty Dog-related news story. Uh, Naughty Dog recently confirmed that in The Last of Us Part Two, there will actually be an NPC um, playing with you alongside uh, Ellie, because, of course, Ellie is the protagonist in The Last of Us Part Two. And if we're talking about the original game, you know, you go through the whole game as Joel, but Ellie's always by your side. And the recent footage that we saw at uh, E3, of course, showed just Ellie and nobody else present actually within the gameplay roaming around the environment. So you'd have to figure that um, once the full game is out, this may be a character that comes in and out of Ellie's life. Or maybe it will be um, different characters that you will be... Uh, you will be playing alongside um but that's interesting because you know that is the the flow that we've had from that first game is that there was always a sense of togetherness you know despite the fact that um early on in the game you were kind of bitter and mean towards one another but uh you always had somebody there and there was always a sense of um a sense of company whereas the last of us part two of course they're going for a much different thing where it's realistic vi like well of course it's always been realistic violence but they want to stay true and grounded and of course it's a game based on hatred so they might you know want to have a lot of moments in that game where you aren't with anybody whatsoever and you want to get a they want to put you in a certain sense of uncomfortability and, and possibly loneliness. Uh, I'm more than certain that's probably a theme that Naughty Dog is probably going to touch on in that game. And, um, you know, they, they, they're, but they are. They're being so secretive about it, and I really want them to kind of stay that way, to be honest. I don't like them revealing all this information. I mean, I, I honestly, I, I would be so okay with, like, turning my lights off right now at this game and not reading any more news or seeing any more footage. I think it's um, a situation where I would love to go into it as blind as possible. Um, and that's usually great advice for any big game that you're super interested in. Uh, but so I don't know. I mean, I'm, st I'm still going to follow the news so I can like talk about it on here. But I think this I, soon it's going to be a situation where I'm not going to want to hear more about it.
Okay, so recently Sucker Punch's Chris Zimmerman uh, was talking a little bit about how the studio wants to get the setting right when it comes to Ghost of Tsushima, because of course it's based on 13th century Japan, and uh, you know, the big discussion with this game really, the kind of hot debate has been that, uh, well, this studio is based in Bellevue, Washington, and it's a western developer, so, you know, why are they, um, you know, are they really the most appropriate developer to focus on an entirely Japanese-centric game? Um, so basically Chris Zimmerman's kind of um, doubling down on this, uh, reassuring people that it's kind of, it's very important for the company to get this right. And they're also saying that they're actually working with all appropriate parties to um, get everything down, of course, because they do work for a, you know, a Japanese corporation as well. It's, you know, it's Sony. Um, they said it's very important for the guys at Sony that they get this right. And so they're working with Japanese developers, um, native Japanese speakers, um, you know, they're doing lots of field work. This is very typical for a big budget video game, which is that it's, it's, it's definitely not uncommon for the developer to, um, you know, scout out not only the talent necessary to get down whatever it is they're trying to get down, but uh, also actually be in the field and, um, you know, take pictures, uh, you know, take video, uh, take notes on and on everything, right? And so they're also pro pro more than likely talking with historians, things like that. Um, and that's definitely the right way to go about it, you know, and I'm glad at least that they're trying to reassure people that they're um, doing this in the best way that they possibly can. And, uh, uh, you know, I have confidence. I mean, it's Sucker Punch. And, uh, and you know, Sony's their publisher. I mean, they, they, yeah. Sony gives their developers creative freedom, but at the same time, Sony's going to keep them keep them in line because um, that's their job. All right, so the big news story from this past week is that there was a LinkedIn job listing uh, for Infinity Ward for a narrative script writer. And if you look into the job listing, it said it's going to be for multiple next-gen platforms. And if you look at the sort of release schedule for Call of Duty games, um, Infinity Ward is up next for 2019. Um, this is, of course, just, yeah, it's not confirmed, mind you, but if you do look at the sort of schedule of how those games have been releasing, Infinity Ward would be due for their game in 2019. A narrative script writer implies that it's going to have a campaign mode, and we all know this, Call of Duty will not have a campaign, and they've confirmed that the next one will. So if you do sort of the Sherlock Holmes uh, case files here, you would figure out, oh my god, 2019 next-gen platforms because the next Call of Duty game is going to be Infinity War with a narrative story. Um, so there's a, a few things here, mind you, which is that this doesn't necessarily mean um, that next-gen platforms would be uh, a 2019 release. Uh, as it stands right now, most analysts and most people in general are expecting um, next-gen hardware for around 2020. Of course, this doesn't you know, Sony and Microsoft could release it late 2019, and that would certainly line up for it because when you also do look at Typical Call of Duty releases, they are always released in the fall or uh, close to the holidays, so it wouldn't be early 2019, certainly. Um, you know, it would be late 2019. But also, this you know, this could be a situation where the games, the next Call of Duty releases on PS4, X1, PC, whatever other platforms uh, it may be, and then, the, you know, they can release PS5 and Xbox One X version, you know, or whatever the next Xbox called. They can release those versions whenever next-gen hardware launches, which would maybe... 2020 more than likely uh, you know who knows when in 2020 maybe mid 2020 maybe closer to the holidays maybe early 2020 so we'd already know about ps5 and uh the next xbox you know well into 2019 at that point because of course there still needs to be a you know anywhere from eight months to a year out of the announcement of the systems and details about them leading up to their release um but it's you know I, it's clearly it also lines up right i mean you know, people are freaking out about it, but it's it's nothing concrete at all. I mean, of course they're working on next gen hardware. Of course they want talent for next gen hardware. Um, you know, we won't know for sure until um, we get close. Because that's the thing. Once we get closer to 2019, well, we are getting close. Once we're in 2019, mind you, I think that's when the next gen stuff's really going to heat up because then we're going to get to the real sort of imminence of it. Like, we're getting plenty of rumors about next gen hardware. But it's, you know, it's so light, it's it's so not concrete at all whatsoever, you know what I mean? Once we get, like, one, like, once we get into 2019, we're going to see a lot of uh, really heavy stuff coming. And it will be more concrete stuff with um, sources much closer to the project, probably inside sources. Um, and then just developers in general that are working with the hardware, you know, you make you make expect plenty of leaks, leaks of what the SDKs actually look like. You know, right now it's a situation where, like we had heard recently, you've got SD, SDKs locked up, like behind closed doors, only accessible to a few uh, team members on a possibly 100-person team. Uh, you know, once we are maybe six, six, eight months forward from now, um, it'll be a 
watch. It's gonna the news is gonna come pouring out. Those are some of the news stories that I want to talk about with you guys from this past week. So once again, thank you so much for watching that video, uh, Vita video. I really appreciate it. Yeah, that one took a while to make, and you can absolutely expect more stuff like that. I'm already gonna be starting up one. Um, soon, like I said, though, it takes a long time to make, so don't expect it anytime soon. But um, you should absolutely expect more content like that in the future. And I really hope I um, I keep you guys entertained and intrigued. And um, just thanks for uh, all the years of overwhelming support. Uh, I always mean that. Uh, absolutely, you guys are awesome. You're the best. You're what keeps me going. So anyway, that concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Bedecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me, and I will see you guys next Friday.